In this presentation, we will look at the first half of this week's reading, Hosea chapters 1 through 6. By way of introduction, during the time of Hosea, the Israelites were influenced heavily by the worship and ways of the Canaanites. The sophistication of the city-based Canaanite farmers who surrounded them, the fertility of the flocks and fields apparently elicited from the gods and goddesses of fertility, attracted, like, attracted the Israelite farmers. The rites by which the people supplicated the gods of fertility were lewd, licentious, and immoral. Even though Israel had covenanted at Sinai to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation unto God, by the time of Hosea, God's people had become deeply involved in the practices of their neighbors, whose ways of life should have been repelled, uh, re should have repelled them. Using the imagery of a marriage, the Lord through Hosea taught that his people that through they that though they had been unfaithful to him, yet he would still not divorce them, cast them off, if they would but turn back to him. The Hosea speaks of a nation, the same principle holds truth for individuals. Even those who have been grossly unfaithful to God can reestablish their relationship with him if they will but turn back to him with full purpose of heart. The Hebrew name of the prophet Hosea signifies help, deliverance, and salvation, and is derived from the same root as the name of Joshua and Jesus. By reason of numerous allusions in the prophecy to the northern kingdom, it is commonly supposed by commentators that Hosea was a native of that commonwealth. Jeroboam II, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, reigned from 788 B.C. until 747 B.C., and Hezekiah, the last name of the king of Judah, began to reign in 725 B.C. We may not be far from the truth if we date Hosea's ministry, therefore, from about 755 to 725 B.C. He was then a common contemporary of three other great prophets, Isaiah, Amos, and Micah. So he will be prophesying during the same time. The northern kingdom has become very wicked. These prophets were sent to warn them that destruction's coming if they don't repent. And so their message, though can be seen a message of doom, there was a way out called repentance. And so they're giving a warning. The only problem is, is the northern kingdom didn't heed repentance. Continuing, in the days of Shia, the northern kingdom had been lifted by Jeroboam II to a commanding position of power and wealth. Israel's ancient boundaries had been restored, and her leaders and chief men were haughty and proud. The southern kingdom of Judah, too, had been revived under King Uzziah in a really marvelous way, according to the account in 2 Chronicles 26, 6-15. Both kingdoms prospered greatly, especially from the booty taken in conquest and revival of trade. The rich built summer houses and wintered houses, houses of ivory and houses of ebony, kind of giving an idea of the wealth they had started to obtain. Their houses were furnished with costly articles of furniture, and for their own personal adornment, they insisted on gorgeous robes and quantities of jewelry. They indulged in the luxuries of the table, taking for themselves the best of the veal and the lamb that the country afforded. The wives of men in high places set high standards of comfort, and social life insisted on drinking wine regardless of the cost. The prophet Amos calls them cows. Actually, kind of like fat cows. That's in Amos 4.1. These debauched women oppress the poor, crush the needy, and in numerous ways seriously weaken the moral fiber of their people. Well, you'd think you were almost describing today, wouldn't you? Hmm, maybe that's why these books are so important today and why God kept them around in the Old Testament. Social and economic changes were widespread. The small landowner, landowner disappeared. He was supplanted by the wealthy land, landlord who created large estates out of little farms. Windows, widows and orphans had little or no protection. Sons were often mortgaged and finally lost as slaves when the mortgage could not be cleared. Such practices were known as early as the days of Elisha, Elijah, in 2 Kings 4, 1-7. 
Tenants on large estates paid rents, which were ruinous, and were subsequently made slaves out of them. Extractions of grain were made upon the poor by the upper crust of society. Seeding want and corruption were everywhere evident. There was cheating in the marketplace and perjury in the law courts. Like I said, wow, I think I was talking about today. Politicians looked to their own interests rather than to those of the nation they were supposed to serve. On the other hand, we find selfish and arrogant luxury facing ragged and loathsome squalor on the other. These conditions meant that Israel was rotten to the core and ripe for destruction. Well, we see that today, so what does that tell us about our society? We are rotten to the core and ripe for destruction. Most of the people of the time thought that they were engaged in the true worship of Jehovah, but Hosea makes plain that their worship was in reality no more than the revival of the old Baal cult. To be sure, men were outwardly more devout and more scrupulous and religious observants than ever before. The courts of the temple and other religious shrines were filled with crowds. Altars smoked with sacrifices. Tithes were paid exactly when due. The Sabbath and other impressive occasions were observed with meticulous care. But all of this ceremonial swank failed to touch Israel's real evils. The religion of her leaders had little or no concern with social morality. In fact, religion not merely condoned many of the evils of which we have spoken, but actually enjoined them. Part of the problem is the priests were involved. The priests of Israel were involved in the wickedness. Such is true of immorality and ritual fornication was by no means unknown. But with the moral decay of Israel, the thing that seemed to have impressed and saddened Hosea most was the state of family life. It had become dissolute, and according to the, accordingly, the prophet lays upon it its heaviest indictment. The Hebrew root zana, translated variously as whoredoms, harlot, and adultery, words so dis distasteful to us, is used by the prophet over 20 times to express his opinion of the situation. 20 times a prophet. Think of it, standing up in conference and calling the members of the church, because that's what we're talking about. This is Israel, the house of Israel, up in the northern kingdom, calling the people whoredoms, harlots. That's what you have all become. That is certainly destruction of family life. Such were the times in which Hosea prophesied. A knowledge of them will help us substantially in understanding the prophet's problem and message. As always, read the chapter and the verses so you get the details down before you get on with the commentary, because I won't go in to explain it. I'll just go and explain certain things uh, so that you'll already have the storyline down and, and what's being discussed. So let's move right into Hosea chapter uh, 1 through 14, the whole book. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the manner of prophesying among the Jews. Nephi said that in 2 Nephi 25, 1. I have a certain way of prophesying that is a little different than what we do today. Nephi said that to understand the writings of Isaiah, one has to understand the Jewish way of prophesying. 2 Nephi 25, 1. The same is true of Hosea because he, like Nephi, made extensive use of metaphors and symbolism. Okay, so that is, they, they use that heavily. And so if you understand the use of that, then you don't get caught up in this, some literalism that will make things too weird. Each chapter contains at least one metaphor and all need to be seen against the background of Israel's history and tradition to be understood. One metaphor that is central to Hosea's message is marriage. Throughout history, every culture has prescribed ways to celebrate the covenants of marriage. Because most people had personal knowledge of marriage, they understood the Lord better when the prophet used marriage terms to describe symbolically the covenants God made with them and they with him. The covenant relationship between Jehovah and his people Israel was likened to the relationship between a man and his wife. 
In the symbolic marriage covenant, God is the husband, and Israel, the covenant people, is the bride or the wife. God wed Israel in the covenant of Abraham. That's in Genesis 17. That covenant was renewed with Moses' people at the foot of Mount Sinai, Exodus 19. Isaiah 54, 5 reads, For thy maker is thine husband. And Jeremiah 3, 14 reads, For I am married unto you. Further reference to God's role as husband in the covenant are found in Jeremiah 3.20 and Jeremiah 31.32 and the book of Revelation 19.7. When Israel turned away from her husband to worship other gods, then she broke the covenant. She had committed great whoredoms, departing from the Lord, Hosea 1.2, and played the harlot. See, isn't that what a prostitute or a whore is? And so you you worship idols even today. That's what you are. You commit whoredoms. You're a whore. Like I said, it's not a word we go around throwing around because it's very disgusting. But maybe we should think about it more, what we're doing and what we are if we participate in this activity. Activities. Idol worship. Worshipping other gods, cheating on Father in Heaven. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, In a spiritual sense, to emphasize how serious it is, the damning sin of idolatry is called adultery. When the Lord's people forsake Him and worship false gods, their infidelity to Jehovah is described as whoredoms and adultery. By forsaking the Lord, his people are unfaithful to their covenant vows, vows made to him who symbolically is their husband. Interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, though, a lot of their idolatry, their idol worship that they participated in, the worship of Baal, part of the ceremonies included adultery. Sexual uh, intercourse was a part of the ceremonies. So interesting how they went hand in hand. The symbolism is central to Hosea's message. He depicts Israel's unfaithfulness to the Lord as that of a wife who has turned her back on a faithful husband to follow her lovers. So what was happening in Hosea's time? Let's get a little background. Following is a brief overview of the societal, political, and religious situation at the time of Hosea. The year of Hosea's life, let me try it again. The years of Hosea's life were melancholy and tragic. The, vi- the vials of the wrath of heaven were poured out on his apostate people. The nation suffered under the evils of that schism, which was affected by the craft of him who had been branded with the indelible stigma, Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin. In other words, talking about the King Jeroboam. Their leaders were very wicked. Back to the quote. The obligation of law had been relaxed and the claims of religion discarded. Baal became the rival of Jehovah and in the dark recesses of the groves were practiced the impure and murderous rites of heathen deities. Peace and prosperity fled the land, which was harassed by foreign invasion and domestic broils. Might and murder became the twin sentinels of the throne. Alliances were formed with other nations, which brought with them seductions to paganism. Captivity and insult were heaped upon Israel by the uncircumcised. The nation was thoroughly debased and by a fraction of its population maintained its spiritual allegiance. So there's society for Hosea. Like I said, that describes today, doesn't it? A lot of our society and our politics and religion, unfortunately. That's why studying this book can be so helpful and so applicable. Because what he's saying to them, our society is doing the same thing. And so if we're doing the same thing, the warnings would be the same and the consequences. Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. How are we to understand God's commanding Hosea to marry a harlot? Remember the use of similes and metaphors, okay? This has messed most people up when they study this book where Hosea says, God commands me to marry a harlot. 
God would, would God literally command one of his servants to take an immoral woman for his wife? Or is this command to be interpreted only in a symbolic sense? Interpretations fall into five general categories. So here's five different ways people have seen this. Number one, Hosea was actually asked by God to marry a harlot. So some take it literally. Those scholars who maintain this view think that such a marriage served as an object lesson to call Israel's attention to their carnal state. Others have felt that such an act would be inconsistent with God who cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Alma 45.16. Well, duh. While the Lord was not commanding Hosea to sin, some have felt God would not use sinful behavior even in an object lesson of this kind. Sidney B. Sperry, a famous Old Testament scholar, said that this would be imputed Imputing, imputing to God a command inconsistent with his holy character. Furthermore, for Hosea to marry a woman with a questionable past would make it impossible for him to preach to his people and expose their sexual immoralities. They could point the finger of scorn and, at him and say, you're as guilty as we are, don't preach to us. So th- being literal is cannot be true. That's going against God's nature, so theory number one is out. Number two, the whole experience came to Hosea in a dream or vision. There was neither a harlot nor marriage, but Hosea was asked to accept the burden of being a prophet, husband, to immoral Israel, Gomer, that was his wife's name. Although possible, most scholars reject this alternative because of the intensity of Hosea's involvement with the imagery. So it isn't just some dream he had. So number two is out. Number three, Hosea married a woman who at the time was good and faithful, better, but later became a faithless wife, a harlot, when she left her husband to participate in the fertility rites of the neighboring Canaanites. In this case, Hosea's life was an enacted parable, and the phrase wife of whoredoms refers to what Gomer became. In other words, Hosea did marry Gomer, but she was not a harlot then. Those scholars who sustain this view explain that later in life, Hosea, looking back on his experience and all that he had suffered and learned through them, recorded incidents that helped illustrate his teachings. The difficulty with this interpretation is that the Lord commanded Hosea to take a wife of whoredoms, not that she became one later. If Gomer were faithful and true at the time of the marriage, this phrase would then seem like a particular way to describe her. So number three is not likely either of what's going on. Number four, a variation of the interpretation in number three is that Gomer was not an actual harlot, but was a worshiper of Baal. Therefore, she was guilty of spiritual harlotry. But even so, it seems peculiar that God would ask a prophet to marry a non-believing wife that actively participated in Baal worship, especially when actively participating in Baal worship included having sexual intercourse with religious prostitutes at their temples and groves. So his wife would have been doing that. See, again, he couldn't be a prophet and go say, okay, Israel, knock off your immorality. And they'll go, what? What what do you, go go clean your house up first, Hosea. See, so number four is out. Number five, another approach that avoids some of these difficulties is that the words presented an allegory designed to teach the spiritual consequence of Israel's unfaithfulness. We know the Jews use this form of prophecy quite a bit. Isaiah uses it a lot. Again, Sidney B. Sperry felt that Hosea never actually contracted such a marriage. He explains, the Lord's call to Hosea to take a harlotous woman to wife represents the prophet's call to ministry, a ministry to an apostate and covenant-breaking people. The children of this apparent union represents the coming of the judgment of the Lord upon Israel, warning of which was to be carried to the people by the prophet. The figure of the harlotous wife and children would, I believe, be readily understood at the time by the Hebrew people without reflecting on Hosea's own wife or if he was unmarried on himself. 
that this interpretation is true and correct. We see from an experience President Henry B. Irene had, he was Elder Irene at the time when he shared this experience, while teaching early morning seminary. And he, he relates this experience to seminary institute teachers at a conference as a role as an apostle. So listen to what he says. The book of Hosea, like the writings of Isaiah, use what seem to me almost poetic images. The symbols in Hosea are a husband, his bride, her betrayal, and a test of marriage covenants almost beyond comprehension. Here are the fierce words of the husband spoken after his wife has betrayed him in adultery. adultery. And then he quotes Hosea 2, 6-7. He goes on through verse 13 to describe the punishment she deserves. And then comes a remarkable change in the verses that follow. And then he reads Hosea 2, 14 through 15, 19 through 23. At that early point in the story, in just two chapters, even my youngest students knew that the husband was a metaphor for Jehovah, Jesus Christ. And they knew that the wife represented his covenant people, Israel, who had gone after strange gods. They understood that the Lord was teaching them through this metaphor, an important principle. Even though with those whom we, he has co covenanted may be horribly unfaithful to him, he would not divorce them if they would only turn back to him with full purpose of heart. I knew that too, but even more than that, I felt something. I had a new feeling back about what it means to make a covenant with the Lord. All my life, I had heard explanations of covenants as being like a contract, an agreement, where one person agrees to do something, another agrees to do something else in return. For more reasons than I can explain during those days teaching Hosea, I felt something new, something more powerful. This was not a story about a business deal between partners, nor about business law. This was a love story. This was a story of a marriage covenant bound by love, by steadfast love. What I felt then, and it has increased over the years, was that the Lord with whom I am blessed to have made covenants loves me and you, and with a steadfastness about which I continually marvel, and which I want with all my heart to emulate. That's the interpretation of Hosea. This is a metaphor. Jehovah the husband, Israel the wife. She is cheated on Jehovah. Making covenants is more. Hosea is trying to impress upon the people then and us today. Making covenants is more than just a legal contractor making promises with God. It should be as intense as the love between a husband and wife. My love between my Father in heaven and me and my covenant should be that sacred and that binding. And then if I break them, then I am cheating on him. I am prostituting the relationship. That's what this book is trying to teach. And that's how we will approach it. So with that, let's take a look at a lot of symbolism is used in metaphors and similes. And so let's take a look at some of the names and the symbolism behind the names that are going to be used in the book of Hosea. Biblical names often were taken from the circumstances surrounding the child's birth. In Hosea's narrative, Gomer bore her husband three children, two sons and a daughter. The names given to the children symbolize the destruction that lies in Israel's result as a future as a result of her idolatrous or adulterous ways. That is, children, judgments, are the natural result of Israel's harlotry, unrighteousness. So what are the fruits of idolatry, adultery, sinfulness? Well, the fruit, just like the fruit of a marriage is children, the fruits of unrighteousness is the judgments of God. So that's what the children represent. The name of the first child, Jezreel, 
is the same as that of the valley of the former king Yehu's, Yehu's blood purge and foreshadows Israel's overthrow in that strategic valley. It is a valley overlooked by Megiddo and, f and famed for crucial battles past and future. Jezreel means God will sow or scatter abroad, since anciently sowing was done by casting handfuls of seed. It, is undoubtedly, it undo undoubtedly alludes to the overthrow and scattering of Israel. God is going to scatter, sow Israel. The name Lo -ru Ruamah in Hebrew means not having obtained mercy. Ruamah has mercy, Lo means not and suggests that no amount of mercy from God would set aside divine justice and save northern Israel. The ten tribes would be taken captive and led away. It doesn't mean that God is not merciful. Let me explain that. No amount of mercy, meaning mercy is not unconditional, brothers and sisters. God doesn't just hand out mercy. It's based upon the conditions of repentance. So it doesn't didn't. So in other words, it's saying no matter about how much mercy God has and wants to help Israel, they won't repent. Therefore, justice must come. See, mercy cannot rob justice. We know that in the Book of Mormon. And so Israel won't repent. Therefore, God cannot grant mercy. The judgments are coming. If you want mercy in life, you want God to be merciful, then repent. Make better choices. You get more freedom. The name of the third child, Lo Ami, Lo means no or not. Ami means people. In Hebrew means then not my people. Is like a lament and shows that by their harlotry, Israel could not be thought of as God's people. So you can see the symbolism and the names of the children and what Hosea was trying to teach was coming, the seeds that were coming. You are not God's people. You're going to be cast to the wind. You're going to be sown. You're going to be scattered. Okay? And, and because you won't repent, I, God can't have mercy on you. Justice must come. With the last two symbolic names, the Lord predicted the negative results of sin. But in the next verse, he held out a promise of hope. Hosea 7, 10, or 1, chapter 1, verse 7, 10. Throughout the book, Hosea interweaves the promise of destruction or a curse with the promise of future restoration to favor. So, with all that, let's put it all together and let's take a look at chapter 1. Let's, let's interpret all the metaphors and meanings and what is the story teaching us. Hosea 1 verses 2 through 3 as hosea as hosea symbolic of jehovah and his wife gomer symbolic of god's people israel like a wife who has broken her sacred covenant of marriage by being unfaithful has become as a prostitute israel has become unfaithful to jehovah through idolatry and the adult ad adultery that was associated with canaanite pagan worship thus committing whoredom spiritually and physically. The offspring of such an iniquitous spouse would be the fruit of unrighteous desires and actions. So you're going to get judgment. So that's verses 2 through 3. Verse 4, Jezreel, meaning God will so signify the town with which the capital of Israel during Jehu's dynasty and the scene of the murders by which he established his rule. That's in 2 Kings 9. The name was given to the child as a reminder of the punishment due for the massacre. I will avenge the blood was a prophecy of the overthrowing of the ruling dynasty when Jeroboam's son, Zechariah, having reigned only six months, as seen in 2 Kings 15, 8 through 10. Israel would soon, soon cease to be a kingdom and be conquered by the Assyrians, which was fulfilled in 2 Kings 17. And so Jehu coming to his dynasty was brought about through murder and bloodshed way back. And, and so that name, when that's where that happens, that valley. And so you can see God, Hosea is tying a lot of their history and, and they're, they're iniquitous kings to what's happening because you have now followed your leaders. And 
and so you're going to become scattered. Verse 5, the valley of Jezreel was the battlefield of Palestine, and nothing would seem more probable to the prophet than that the final overthrow take place there. Verse 6, lo ruamah, meaning not pitied or not having obtained mercy, Israel would not obtain mercy since they refused to repent, thus leading to their coming captivity by Assyria. As we said, mercy is not unconditional. It is conditioned upon, the, upon repentance through the atonement of Jesus Christ. They wouldn't do it, so they couldn't get mercy. Okay, this is not... This is not the idea of what people have in the Old Testament of Jehovah, this unmerciful God, and look how, look how cruel he's being and punishing them and letting the Assyrians commit. No, the people are choosing this by their use of agency. This has nothing to do with Jehovah. This has to do with them. Israel is sinning. They won't repent. The consequence is destruction comes. How hard is that to understand? Jehovah in the Old Testament is very merciful and kind. He would love to have forgiven them if they would have repented. we got to stop this idiotic view of the Old Testament. It's so stupid. Jehovah is so merciful and kind, just like Christ in the New Testament. The people just were stupid in their use of agency. And you do stupid things, you get stupid prizes. And their prize was to be conquered by the Assyrians. God, let's knock off this stupid view of the Old Testament that Satan has put within many and realize this book is talking about us today. We as a society don't repent. Guess what's coming? Not mercy. Verse 7, however, the kingdom of Judah was to obtain mercy at this time and not be destroyed and taken captive by the Assyrians. So Hosea is warning them, saying, look, it's not going to happen immediately, but I'm telling you it's coming. This protection of Judah would not come by military might, but through the power of Jehovah, which is described in 2 Kings 19, with, with the miraculous destruction of Sennacherib's army. Verse 8 through 9, Lo Ami, meaning not my people, was to illustrate the rejection of Israel by Jehovah as his people because of their unrepentant iniquity. Verses 10 through 11. Yet in a future day, in the latter days, Israel and Judah would gather in from their scattered condition, with God as their head and they his children. The day of Jezreel, meaning the union of Israel and Judah, is to be marked by a prosperity which shall take away the reproach from Jezreel. Like I said, that valley has been a place of many crucial battles over history. And one day, Israel will be gathered again, which we're trying to do, and in millennial condition, will once again live there in peace and harmony and prosperity. The ten tribes will come back. And so he's prophesying of the future day. Gospel principle for this chapter. If we sow the seeds of unrighteousness, then we reap the fruits of sorrow, destruction, and captivity. That is what we should get out of this chapter because we are sowing the seeds of unrighteousness in our society. And so it's coming. In Hosea chapter 2, there are many metaphors. So let's take it the metaphors and their meanings and then we'll put it all together again. Verse 1, the metaphor Ami, son of Hosea and Gomer, again means Hebrew for my people. Notice this time that we'll, he doesn't put low in front of it, not my people, but he's going to talk about my people, symbolic of God's people Israel. Verse 1, Ruama, daughter of Hosea and Gomer, means having obtained mercy. Notice the low is not in front of it in this chapter. So he's talking about how I want you to be my people. I want to give you mercy. See, he wants to, but it's based on repentance. Verse 2, your mother. That is the nation of Israel. Verse 3, wilderness. That would be the captivity being taken away. Verse 5, lovers. The priests, priestesses, and idols of the Canaanite temples, or in the larger sense, any person one loves more than God. So 
Israel, the priests, the teachers, um, the pagan worshipers, all of them, seeking after anything other than Jehovah. That was their lovers. Verses 5 through 9 and 13, we have bread, corn, wool, and jewels. So that would be worldly values and treasures, or sometimes even prosperity, symbols of prosperity. Verses 9 through 10, her nakedness and her lewdness, the meaning is real sins. Her sins of idolatry and adultery, which are involve nakedness and lewdness. Verse 14, allure her. Jehovah still care, cares for her and will try to win her back, get her attention. We already talked about it. chapter 1 alluded to it at the end there, that in the latter days, God will win back his, his wife. Verse 15, Valley of Achor, a rich valley north of Jericho near Gilgal, meaning the Lord will restore her to great blessings. That's what that symbolically means when he uses that, because it was a rich valley, great blessings. Verse 16, Ish, Ishi, meaning Hebrew for my husband, and Bali, Hebrew for my master. Eventually, Israel will accept God as her Lord and her true husband. Verse 19 through 20, We see, Betrothed thee unto me forever. The fullness of the new and everlasting covenant restored to Israel in the latter days and the eternal blessings that result from, result from Israel's faithful marriage to Jehovah. So she will again, once again, come back through the restoration of the gospel, being taught it, and embracing the, the new and lasting covenant of marriage and baptism coming into the true fold of God. Verse 22. Jezreel, Hebrew for God, will sow. The downtrodden and poor Israel, like the Jezreel Valley, they have great potential and will be re-sown and made fruitful by the Lord. He, 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 will re he will bring them back together and replant them. Like I said, that will be probably the millennium when the ten tribes return and they, they come back into the gospel covenant. Now, let's pull it together and let's go through chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Israel and her offspring, those who once had mercy and were God's people, are no longer the children of Jehovah because of their whoredoms, which Jehovah pleads with them to put away, lest he expose her shame, strips her naked, it says in the verse, and she be taken to captivity where she will thirst for freedom and not receive mercy. For Israel had acted like a prostitute, loving many and going after the things of the world. Verse 6. Therefore, Israel's way to eternal life will be stopped. She will be taken off the straight and narrow path that leads to God. Verse 7. Through the disastrous Disasters brought by a foreign enemy, including the siege of the city, the people would discover the impotence of their idols and seek Jehovah in earnest. But by the time they can get back, you see, it's going to be a little late. They're still going to have to go through the consequence. But they're going to realize, God, those Canaanite gods didn't save us. Verse 8, Israel was seriously ignorant of the material blessings Joseph had given her. Corn, wine, oil, silver, gold. But instead used them for offerings to the false gods, god Baal. How insulting to use God's gift in this way. So all these blessings he had blessed them with was prosperity, wine, corn, oil, silver, gold, and stuff. And they used them to worship false gods. But does that happen today? Do people even in the church use the material they blessings to not point them to God and for God's kingdom and building up Zion, but to consume on their own lust and worship the gods they want to worship? G yeah. Verse 9 through 13. Consequently, Jehovah will rescind his blessings and expose her sins for all to see, which in turn will cause all gladness to cease, along with all festivals, fe feast festivals, and days that were devoted to worship of Jehovah. 
the rewards which Israel thought her false gods, lovers, gave her, such as vines and fig trees, a, a, a productive land. See, they contributed this to because they worship Baal will be destroyed, and the land will become a wasteland. You want to see how well it does to worship Baal? I'll show you. God's judgments will be visited upon Israel for her playing the harlot with her earrings and jewels before Baal, which were of no more significance to her to cause her to forget Jehovah. So they're going to find out. Go ahead, dress up with your earrings and jewels and go worship in the groves of Baal. Yeah, go after other lovers. Go ahead and cheat on me. And let's see how that turns out for you. Well, we're going to find out in our own society, and we are finding out. Verse 14, however, in a future day, Jehovah will seek after Israel, allure her, entice her to repent, gather back to her husband. See, that's the return and the gathering of Israel, and the return of the lost tribes. So, Hosea is seen way into the future. Verse 15, the vineyards destroyed by the enemy would be restored in that day, the millennial day. Achor was the valley where Achan was stoned for his sins. See Joshua 7.26. It was on this account called the valley of Achor, or trouble, what is meant by its use here is that while the Israelites would find that as of old sin would be followed by punishment. The punishment was meant to purify and discipline, and the trouble was the door of hope. And once again, sing the song of redeeming love. So Israel, because they won't repent, God is going to put them through because they have chosen punishment, judgment, but God doesn't do it out of anger. He, he puts us through things, so hopefully we'll turn our hearts and turn to him and repent and realize, oh, the only way out of this misery I am in is to turn my heart to Jehovah, to Christ. Come unto Christ. See, in this case, it's taken thousands of years. But Christ, Christ has us go through things to help us come unto him. And the sooner you do it, the sooner you can get out of the pain. Verses 16 through 17. At that day, in the latter days, Israel will call Jehovah my husband, Ishi, and no more worship false gods. Verses 18 through 23. And in the latter days, God will renew his covenant with Israel and be once again betrothed to him in righteousness, judgment, and merciful loving kindness. Then will Israel know the Lord because of their restoration to the true gospel through the covenants. And then shall the great Jehovah hear and restore again blessings upon her. Jezreel, God soweth, used for Israel for the uh, used for Israel for the sake of the play on the word, cries f for the corn. Sorry, this is I didn't check the. Spelling this, cries for the corn and wine and oil. These, cr these cry to the earth to produce them. The earth in its turn cries to heaven for rain, and the rain cries to Jehovah to send it. Jehovah hears the cry, and so that the heart's desire of the people is granted, even without their expressly asking Jehovah for it. So you can see him using all these metaphors and playing on words. Of God soweth that once again God will sow corn, wine, and oil. In other words, prosperity among Israel and the ten tribes as they're restored. They'll come to know the Lord. He will hear them. He, he will then bless them. He can now bless them because they've repented. And they've come into the true fold. Gospel principle. Forgetting God and focusing on the world will only result in sorrow and destruction. Only through repentance to the atonement of Christ can we obtain mercy and be restored to God. Well, let's take a look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. What is represented by the marriage in chapter 3? In the first and third chapters of Hosea, the Lord commands his prophet to marry. 
Scholars disagree on whether these represent two separate marriages or the same one. Either way, they were an effective means for the Lord to teach the people of his own relationship with faithless Israel. Regardless whether, since these are metaphorical, the littleness of other one or two marriages is really fruitless to even worry about. From the beginning, Israel played the harlot, played the part of the harlot. We saw that in Hosea 1 2. Even after entering into covenant, covenants of obedience and faithfulness to the Lord as a married spouse, she forsook her husband, the Lord, the Lord and went whoring after idol gods. See chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. That's what he's describing there. Kyle and Delich, great Old Testament scholars, wrote The price paid is not to be regarded as purchase money because it says he bought the wife, so they're explaining this phrase, for which the wife was obtained from her parents, for it cannot be shown that the custom of purchasing a bride from her parents had any existence among the Israelites. It was rather the marriage present which a bridegroom gave, not to the parents, but to the bride herself, as soon as her consent had been obtained. Think of the, the money, the bride price. Just think of this, this metaphor. Just think of this comparison. Think of what Christ could give us if we'll just stay faithful and stay married to him. Think of the purchase money that the husband gives to the bride. Boy. And we go off in our movies and our fashions and our language and tattoos and all different kinds of stuff to other gods and not even considering what Christ could give us. Through paying this price, Hosea, symbolizing the Lord, was able to place her Israel beyond her former consorts and receive her back as his own. Hosea 3, 2, come unto me. Verse 2 gives the price of redeeming the woman spoken of in verse 1. Kyle and Delich write that it is, very, it is a very natural supposition that at the time an ephah of barley was worth a shekel, in which was the whole price would be just amount to the sum of which, according to Exodus 21.32, it was possible to purchase a slave and was paid half in money and half in barley. The circumstance that the prophet gave no more for the wife than the amount at which a slave could be obtained and that this amount was not even paid in money but half of it in barley, a kind of food so generally despised throughout antiquity, was intended to depict still more strikingly the deeply depressed condition of the woman. If the woman was satisfied with 15 shekels and 15 ephahs of barley, she must have been in a state of very deep distress. So showing the little amount and the way that he paid for the wife shows that wasn't worth much. And so Hosea is trying to tell Israel, because of your actions, you're not worth much. You've lost your worth. And I'm not talking esteem and that thing, but they're, they're worth and, and, and to be saved, he can't help them. When one considers Gomer as symbolic of Israel, the purchase price implies that Israel's freedoms had been or would be lost. In addition, she suffered the slavery of sin, which also requires a purchase price before Israel could be reconciled with her Savior. Hosea desired a pur to purchase his wife from slavery, just as Heavenly Father seeks after his children to redeem them from the power, Satan's power with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So you see the symbolism and what is going on, what he's trying to teach here, and why this is still so applicable to us today? Because of the fallen nature of man, we are all slaves to sin. And Christ wants to pay for that. We just have to use our agency to let him. Again, we have to make the choice. 
chapter 3, verse 3, thou shalt not play the harlot. Even though the purchase price mentioned in Hosea 3, 2 had been paid, there is a time of testing, of waiting and preparing before one is reinstated to all the blessings of the covenant and enjoys the company of a husband and a savior. This principle is valid whether applied to Gomer as a person or Gomer as a figure for Israel. See, did you truly repent? Are you truly worthy of being restored? Or will you go off and play the harlot again? Hosea 3, 4 through 5, the captivity. Hosea 3, 4 alludes to Israel's impending captivity when they would be without leadership kings, princes, and without the temple and religious practices they believed in, such as sacrifice. They would also be without revelation, represented by the ephod to which the Urim and Thummim were attached. The teraphim were worshipped by the Canaanites as givers of earthly prosperity and deities who revealed the future. Commentators believe that these objects of Canaanite worship were included with objects from the worship of Jehovah to show the people that the worship of idols would also be lost. David, their king, verse 5, is one of the titles of the Messiah or Jesus Christ. In the latter days, Israel would return to her rightful king and seek the Lord. As noted in Hosea 3.3, Gomer had to purify her life before she could fill Hosea's love. In their captivity, Israel would suffer without God's help until she purified her life. Then she would know of God's continued love. See, the restored gospel of Joseph Smith, after thousands of years of apostasy, is a show of God's love and mercy, as he's now alluring Israel back. See, that's the start of the allurement. Joseph Smith, Grove of Trees, and then 1830, Restoration of the Gospel. And we start now bringing Israel back, trying to bring her back from her fallen condition in captivity. Well, let's go to chapter 4, the Lord's controversy with Israel. Chapter 4, verse 1, Jehovah has an accusation against Israel as a whole because of all manner of wickedness against God and man. Controversy used means the Lord proclaims a legal case against the inhabitants of Israel because the people discarded the truth, mercy, and knowledge of the Lord. They now stand in jeopardy of being convicted. So that's the accusation he makes to them. He's going to take legal proceedings to divorce them if they don't repent and shape up, as anyone would in a relationship. Verse 2, Jehovah has brought this legal accusation against Israel because of swearing. The word in Hebrew is Allah, meaning to utter a curse or or invoke evil upon someone. So that's... That's what that's what means by that's what they were doing. The people in society were were cursing others and probably like gospel, invoking evil, hoping evil would have someone because they didn't like them. See, that, that's what they mean by swearing here. Lying meaning to deceive, killing, stealing, committing adultery, which led to acts of violence. Bloodshed, touch of blood, meaning the whole land is covered with blood of the murdered. A strong expression to denote the frequency of murder. So in their society, there is a lot of uh, talking behind other people and gossiping and wishing evil intent upon others, malice. Then there's lying, speaking to deceive. There's killings, there's stealings, there's adultery, and there's murder. Hmm. Well, that's 2022. We're doing the same. Hmm. Maybe we should pay attention to these chapters. Verse 3, the whole land with its animal and vegetable life, is polluted by their sin and must share their punishment. Compare Jeremiah 4.23. See also Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, in which the Lord outlines the relationship between the boundaries of the land and the righteousness or wickedness of the people. Verse 4. Contention and strife among the people and with the priests appears to be common. Another reading of the verse could be, Thy people are as they that strive with me. Priest, thou shalt stumble, with verse 5 and 6 being addressed to the priests. 
So you, you've got corruption everywhere. The priests, the people, um, they're all striving against Jehovah. Verse 5, therefore the mother, the nation of Israel, would be destroyed, and the prophet, that is the class of prophets who said what they knew would please their hearers, would fall. So, so the false prophets, there were many of them at the time of Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah, and as, as there are today. Verses 6 through 7, this destruction will come because of the lack of knowledge about God and his ways. The priest should have instructed the people in God's law, that is, his moral teaching, and were therefore responsible for their ignorance. Instead of that, they had willfully refused even to learn themselves and rejected Jehovah. Thus, Jehovah will reject them. Thy children, that is, the whole, land, the whole body of priests who only sinned worse as they increased in number. So that's why it said they kept continuing. They got worse and worse because the priests were constantly sinning. And the more of them, the more they taught each other and the more they sinned. Verse 8, the priests enriched themselves with the sin offerings and with this aim encouraged more sin instead of checking sin. That is, took delight in it because it paid so well. You would bring an offering of the lamb to the sin offering and part of that went to the priest to take care of them. Well, see, they came up on the great idea, the priest, well, if these people sin more, they've got to bring more offerings, and that means more we get. And so we'll have them sin more, so we get more. You see what they got into? Kylan Delich explained, sin of my people referred to the sin offering of the people, the flesh of which the priests were commanded to eat to wipe away the sins of the people. That's in Leviticus 6.26. And the remarks... Upon this law, Leviticus 10, 17, the fulfillment of this command, however, became a sin on the part of the priest from the fact that they desired their, their soul, that is, their longing desire to the transgression of the people. In other words, that they wish the sins of the people to be increased in order that they may receive a good supply of sacrificial meat to eat. So just as I explained, oh, we get people sin more. They're going to offer more lambs and sacrifices. The more we get, and the more wealthy we get. Mm. So they thought they had a good thing going here. This is how you really get a corrupt society. Get your religious people to become corrupt too. Especially the leaders. Verses 9 through 11. Priests and people had sinned alike and would be punished alike. Greed and lust were both violations of God's natural laws and would therefore have an unnatural result. Heart, in this verse, here probably as the seat of the understanding and where conversion takes place, would be empty because of their lust for the things and appetites of the world. He means here that sexual immorality and strong drink, anciently they went hand in hand as they do now, weaken the mental power and produce a people stupid and falling to ruin. Boy, is that so true today. So without understanding, meaning their heart, and there's no conversion, and yeah, when you have people that are not, they do not have any standards, not converted to standards of morality, then you get a very stupid people indeed, which we have today. Verse 12, my people ask counsel at their stalks and their staffs. What does that mean? Well, idols were frequently made out of stumps and stems of trees and were not only worshipped, but sometimes used for oracle purposes, such as a, a thing proved how senseless the people had become. They started asking their wood, the things they made out of their wood. They started asking them to, to reveal things to them. Oh my gosh. Oh, sounds like some religions today, doesn't it? Whoredom is here faithful, faithlessness to Jehovah, but as such rites as those referred to were characterized by gross sexual immorality, the metaphor is especially appropriate. Verse 13, the summits of hills were the most frequent situations for sanctuaries in primitive times. Hence the high places, oaks and poplars, meaning trees were often connected with sacred rites of the pagan religion. Because the shadow thereof is good, meaning with shadow being figurative for protection 
from something. The people thought that pagan worship at the top of the hills and in the groves of trees to the Canaanite gods, which was fraught with immorality, would bring them protection. Therefore, such faithlessness towards Jehovah would be would produce faithlessness and immorality in their daughters and spouses. You're just going to pass it on. So that's what he's talking about in verse 13. Verse 14, they have no right to ask Jehovah to punish sins in their daughters or their brides, which in another form they commit themselves in their impure pagan rites. Verse 15, Hosea appeals to Judah not to imitate Israel's sins. This is the southern kingdom. Gilgal and Bethel, Bethel means house of God, are contemptuously called beth which means house of vanity or house of idolatry. Were two, these Gilgal and Bethel were two of the most important Israelite sanctuaries. Hosea is here condemning the use of Jehovah's names and oaths because that name had been so profaned by its association with idolatrous symbols. So that's why he calls Gilgal and Bethel Beth Avon. No, you've turned these places of worship into houses of idolatry, vanity, meaning worthlessness. Verse 16, Israel is compared to a, black, a backsliding heifer, which are heifers not fully trained to bear the yoke, which jibs, meaning unwilling to do or accept something, instead of going obediently forward. He would gladly have treated them as docile lambs, not as stubborn heifers. How then can the Lord then feed them as lambs in a wide pasture? A lamb in a large place suggests a helpless animal lost in a large open area with no protection. This figure suggests Israel being scattered among the Gentiles. Verses 17 through 19. Israel is to be left alone to face her consequences of idolatry. Israel's carousing with the world is over. Her whoredoms have been constant and consistent. And they deeply love their disgrace. They would be carried off without reprieve by the wind of judgment. Their altars of sacrifice shall be put to shame, that is, being destroyed. Gospel Principle, Chapter 4. All blessings are predicated upon obedience to law. Thus, when we disobey, we are in violation of God's laws and thus stand condemned. That's the controversy. Jehovah has with Israel. Well, chapter 5, predictions of punishment. Let's take a look at these. Verses 1 through 2 in chapter 5. Judgment is toward you, meaning judgment belongs to you by right, and having abused your privilege, you deserve greater punishment. Mitzvah and Tabor, both mountains, were famous for hunting, hence the net and snare imagery he uses. Revolters were those who drove animals into a pit that had been camouflaged. The metaphor depicts the rulers and priesthood in the bloody role of the hunters who spiritually killed their prey, Israel. Their violence will not escape punishment. Verse 3 through 4, Israel and Ephraim are synonymous. When he says Ephraim, it's the same people, the northern kingdom. The people had corrupted themselves by sins of impurity, but Jehovah had seen it and would punish. Their behavior does not permit them to return to their God. See footnote 4a. To repent would mean to give up their cherished vices. Their disposition is to prostitute themselves with immorality. Do I have cherished vices I haven't given up yet? See, this, chapter, these, this book is very applicable to us. Yeah, I do. I'm trying to get rid of those cherished vices that maybe I like too much. That's why I haven't repented of them yet. Verse 5, worse still, they were actually proud of themselves and their doings. God sounds like having a parade to celebrate your pride, doesn't it? Or celebrating in months. Hmm. Their vaunting of their wickedness was its most obvious proof. Thus, both Israel and Judah will fall. Whoa, do we have any vaunting of pride and wickedness today? Are people proud of their wickedness in opposition to God's law? Hmm. Maybe our society will fall. Verses 6 through 7, the time would come when they would in vain offer sacrifices. 
with their flocks and herds, to Jehovah to seek his favor. But they would come to know that he had left them because of their unrighteous use of agency. The result of their faithless union with heathen gods was a race of people who were not true Israelites. That's what he means by strange children. Acknowledged and loved of Jehovah. Kylan Delich said, Israel ought to have begotten children of God in the maintenance of the covenant with the Lord. But in its apostasy from God, it had begotten in an adulterous generation, children whom the Lord could not acknowledge as his own. That, that is strange children indeed. Verses 8 through 9, Hosea ironically bids the herald call the people to arms to defend themselves against an invading foe. Gibeah, which means hill, and Ramah, a high place, would both be suitable spots for sounding an alarm. That Israel was to cry aloud in beth Avon, meaning house of idolatry, shows Hosea's irony. So you're going to call and sound the alarm in the house of idolatry. The call to arms from a state of vanity and idolatry is rich indeed. But such preparations would be quite useless. The judgment was surely coming. See, that's what Hosea is trying to get across to them. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 27, 17 says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. In ancient Israel, property was marked with stone markers or landmarks. To move such a mark was a serious offense, for it was the same as stealing land. If one who destroys a neighbor's boundaries was cursed, how much more cursed were the princes of Judah who destroyed the moral and spiritual boundaries that guard the worship of Jehovah? They had abused their power to oppress and rob the people. The prophets here include Judah in his denunciations and threats of consequent punishment. The Assyrians who demolished the northern kingdom crippled Judah in the days of Hezekiah. The deliverance of Judah, temporary as in fact proved, was a later revelation of prophecy. Verse 11, the phrase walked after the commandments indicates that Ephraim was oppressed because it willingly walked after filth instead of walking after true commandments. See uh, verse 11 Footnote 8, 511a. Verse 12, moth comes from ash, which means uh, waste or consumer. Thus Ephraim will be wasted or consumed, and then as it says, Judah will decay. Verse 13, this refers probably to King Menahem of Israel paying tribute to Tiglath Pileser. Uh, that's the king of Assyria in 2 Kings 15, 19. The name Jerob, the king of Assyria, it means adversary, is coined by Hosea to point out the absurdity of their sinking help from such a source. In the words, when Judah saw his wound, Hosea seems to hint at a similar policy on the part of Judah, which was afterwards pursued by both Ahaz and Hezekiah. So they're seeking protection, making alliance and paying tribute to other kingdoms that are bigger than them. And Hosea is saying, you people, if you just turn to your true king, he will protect you. Verses 14 through 15. The chastisement of Israel and Judah is represented as a lion that seizes its prey, tearing in pieces and taking its prey away without deliverance. The prophet still hopes that the warning of these calamities will produce repentance and the remission of the full calamity. Meanwhile, Jehovah will leave them to the discipline of his punishment. Gospel Principle, Chapter 5, Unrepentant Iniquity Will Bring Sorrow, Calamity, Sorrow, and Destruction. Well, Chapter 6, the last one in this presentation, A Call to Return. Verses 1 through 2 in Chapter 6 may be a symbolic reference to the gathering of Israel and the millennium. If a, a day is a thousand years... Uh, to the Lord, which we see in 1 Peter 3 8, Israel is to be revived and blessed some two or three thousand years in the future. And certainly that's what we're seeing, right? Verse 3 is a call to seek the knowledge of Jehovah, whose rising is fixed like the morning dawn, and whose blessing is as the later and former rain upon the earth. To the farmer in ancient Israel, two rains were very critical. 
The former or first rain softened the earth so that they could plow it and plant the seeds. The later or second rain gave the crops its growth. And so if they would just seek Jehovah, he would bless them. Verses 4 through 5. The thought of the possible future stands in deep contrast to the gloomy present. And a note of joy passes into a note of wailing. As the morning cloud and dew rapidly disappear, so the efforts of Israel after real goodness, especially kindness, lack endurance. To hew out or carve, in uh, I think it's verse 5, means through true prophets, God had hewed or carved the nation, worked it like a piece of hard wood. In other words, had tried to improve it and shape it into a holy nation, answering to it its true calling. Slain by the words of my mouth, meaning which the prophets had spoken, that it is not merely caused death instruction, but to pro be proclaimed to them, but suspended judgment and death over them, since there dwells in the word of God the power to kill and to make alive. The last part reading, my judgment go forth as a light, the judgment inflicted upon the sinner was so obvious, so conspicuous, clear as the sun, that everyone ought to have observed it and laid it to heart. Verse 6. What did Israel act lack in her relationship to Jehovah? As this verse talks about. Well, Bernard W. Anderson, a scholar, explained it this way. Israel's fidelity then was that of a fickle woman. It lacked the steadfastness, the trustworthiness of true covenant love. In Hosea's native language, Israel lacked chesed. That's the Hebrew word. This word is exceedingly difficult to render into English. The Revised Standard Version usually translates it as steadfast love. It is a covenant word that refers to the faithfulness or loyal love that binds two parties together in covenant. When a person shows chesed to another, he is not motivated merely by legal obligation, but by an inner loyalty which arises out of the relationship itself. Such covenant love has a quality of consistency, or constancy, and consistency, firmness, steadfastness. In Hosea's vivid figure, Israel's chesed was like a transient morning cloud, or like the morning dew that evaporates quickly. See verse 4. Hence, Jehovah, Yahweh, scorned the existing forms of worship. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. We probably should not press Hosea's words to mean that he was opposed to formal worship, but clearly he was opposed to forms that were devoid of the spirit of true faithfulness to the God of the covenant. Jesus asked his hearers, tw twice asked his hearers to go and reread Hosea 6.6 6, when he was accused of breaking the formal rules of orthodoxy. That's Matthew 9.13 and Matthew 12.7. Christ refers twice to this verse in the New Testament. Don't tell me the book of Hosea probably isn't important. I mean, yes, you need to go through the formal things of worship, the sacrifices and things that I've given you and the burnt offerings, but I want you to do it with a steadfast heart, a heart that is loyal to me, a heart that is kind, a heart that has mercy and love in it. They were all to point to me. I want you, I want me to be in your heart. They just went to church and protect the sacrament and didn't think about the emblems. See, that's what they were doing. They just formally went through it and never got Christ in their heart. That's what chesed is, getting Christ in your heart. And yes, you will still do the forms of worship and go and offer and do this, but the way you treat people and the love and the mercy you will have. That's what Christ was trying to tell the Pharisees. They were so caught up in the formalism that they never got to the heart. Well, our programs in this church can do that if we just run programs. Verses 7 through 8. And regarding mere sacrifice as a substitute for goodness, which God had made the conditions of his covenant, they had broken it. 
Gilead being a city of refuge, it was doubtless the place of an earlier sanctuary. But holy cities were now become notorious for their wickedness. Verse 9, Kylan Delich explained, verse 9, In these crimes the priests take the lead. Like highway robbers, they form themselves into gangs for the purpose of robbing travelers and putting them to death. They murder on the way to Shechem. Shechem, a place on Mount Ephraim between Ebal and Gizrim, the way to Shechem is mentioned as a place of murders and bloody, bloody deeds because the road from Samaria, the capital, and in fact from the northern part of the kingdom generally to Bethel, the principal place of worship belonging to the kingdom of the ten tribes, lay through this city. Pilgrims to the feast, for the most part, took this road, and the priests, who were taken from the dregs of the people, appeal, appear to have lain in wait for them, either to rob or in case of resistance to murder. So that's what's going on. Verse 10, Thus does Israel heap up abomination upon abomination. The house of Israel is the kingdom of the ten tribes. Horrible things signifies abominations and crimes of every kind. Spiritual and literal whoredom is singled out as the principal sin. What did Joseph Smith say would be the principal thing against the Israel in the last days? Sexual immorality. Literal whoredoms would plague us, and so they do. Verse 11, harvest is a figurative term for the judgment, as in, uh, that's probably Joel 3.13 and Jeremiah 51.3. As Judah has sinned as well as Israel, it cannot escape the punishment. Ami, meaning my people, the people of Jehovah, is not Israel of the ten tribes, but the covenant nation as a whole. The misery into which Israel of the twelve tribes had been brought through its falling away from God, not the Assyrian or Babylon exile, but the misery brought about by the sins of the people. God could only avert this by means of judgments through which the ungodly were destroyed and the penitent converted. Consequently, the following is the thought which we obtain from the verse. When God shall come to punish, that he may root out ungodliness and bring back his people to their true destination, Judah will also be visited with the judgment. Gospel principle. We are to have a true loving covenant relationship with God, knowing and doing his will, not just ritualistic performances of ordinances. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.